application requires that until 100% of the lots are sold, that the homeowners have no representation on the homeowners association board. And so the, the idea is, is not to uh, give a majority of control to the homeowners, but these people are required to pay fees on a regular basis, and they have no voice and no representation and very little recourse. If you look at the code regarding condominiums, with condominiums, if the, uh, if the center has been there for more than 10 years, or the um, more than 75% of the units are sold, then the progression to homeowner inclusion on the board begins. And so I think that we've been through many different variations on this particular bill to try and find a way to make it work. I know that this has been something that's been brought to the General Assembly before, and it, it has some strong um, opponents and supporters on both sides. And I would actually submit that we consider sending this to the Housing Commission for a review, maybe a letter from you, Dr. Mr. Ruff, Senator Ruff, I'm gonna get the right label there. Um, and that maybe maybe they can make some sense out of this because it you know it seems that um, you know that there, there needs to be some tie to the ownership for the release of the common properties in a in a homeowners association. So you're making the motion. I am. I think that's where we're gonna end up, but I could let us talk all day, but I know how your day's going. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I would, Mr. Chairman, I would make the motion that we uh, gently PBI the bill with a letter to the Housing Commission to take this bill up. To report back next year so I can introduce some legislation. Second. 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 Chairman, I have an amendment. This is a Senate Bill 1341. There's an amendment, and then there's also a quick line amendment to your name. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, this is a bill you, you all saw last year, and uh, it got referred to JCOTS. I can't remember at which point in the process, um, but it got sent to JCOTS, got looked at by JCOTS. We had a meeting with about 30 people, uh, didn't get a lot of feedback, but we ended up uh, uh, revising it, coming out with what you have in front of you. The idea behind this is that it's to enable state and local governments to be able to digitally certify public records. Right now, if you want to get a certified copy of a government document, you have to go to the record custodian, and they have to sign it with a pen, and then put a stamp on it. And that's the way we've historically certified documents for, you know, 200 years or whatever in the United States. In the last five or ten years, the federal government and other states have started to digitally certify documents using, you know, digital, um, you know, fancy encrypted Adobe document certificates. And um, but Virginia has never adopted standards that allow us to do it here. And the advantage of that would be, for example, if I want to get a deed from the courthouse, I could go online on a computer and pull up the PDF of the document, say I want a certified copy, you know, pay five bucks, and then they email me the certified copy so I don't have to walk down to the courthouse. Or if I want to get a copy, say, and show somebody's a, a doctor or a nurse. They go on the Department of Health's website, pull up their name, see they're a doctor or a nurse, and say, I want a certified copy of that so I don't have to make a phone call or send a letter or march down to the Department of Health and, and get that copy. Um, the, um, there was a little bit of confusion about this, which is why this amendment came through. There was, I think, a concern amongst a lot of state agencies that this was requiring them to develop 
digital authentication. That was never the intent. It was always intended to be permissive so that if they want to make their documents <laughs> available digitally, um, this would create a structure for them to do it with them but not require it. And that was what the point of this amendment was, number one. And number two, there's a, a quick line amendment that needs to be made, Mr. Chairman, and that's on line 53. The word electronic needs to be struck and replaced with digital. It says electronic signature. Electronic signature is not a defined term anywhere in the bill, but digital signature is. And so I would entertain that motion to swap it out from electronic to digital on line 58. You're making that motion? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, on line 23, first word is electronic. Does he want to fix that one, too? Um, I would say to the gentleman, Mr. Chairman, that, that electronic document is not a defined term, but digital signature is a defined term. An electronic signature is not. That's why we had to fix that one. If you want to change it to digital document, we could, I guess, but it's not necessary. If you see right there on lines 25 and 26, I'm sorry, I don't know. Line 19, it says digital signature. And the problem was is that down there on line 53, it talked about an electronic signature. That's not defined. That's one to make It's just trying to keep, keep it all... Yeah. You're an attorney. I'll say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, now. If it's a friendly amendment in the paper, it feels like it might keep continuity in this whole thing. We're talking about digital instead of electronic. It's fine. I don't... Okay, proper move. And second, that we make that change also. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Is there anyone here in opposition to 1341? All right. Properly moved that 1341 be reported as amended. Mr. Chairman, zero. Financial. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, can I address that real quick? Yes. Just in full disclosure. So I got a fiscal impact as I was walking in here, and the fiscal impact statement. Um, uh, I think what it's trying to say is that there's a fiscal impact of 250 to 500 thousand dollars. If it's a mandatory bill, we just change it to a discretionary bill. It just requires them to adopt the standard. And the fiscal impact statement says that developing the standard specifically says the development of standards is not expected to generate a fiscal impact. And that's what we just made the bill do. So as amended, I don't think there's a fiscal impact. Uh, but I did just get a statement as I was walking in here because everybody thought it was a mandatory, you got to do this kind of a bill, which it's not. They have not requested it uh, because of time frames. Uh, it's some deal on whether you want to send it to us so that we can do it or not. You know. I'd rather not go there. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. John, a question yeah. for the paper. Uh, Senator Servo, would, would you consider a friendly amendment to strike the language allowing um, the charging of a fee not to exceed five dollars. We're essentially talking about asking somebody to create a PDF um, and charging a fee of five dollars. Or really, I would think a, any fee for creating a PDF on their uh, desktop seems a bit rich. I like the idea, um, and I think we'd be inclined to support it if that language were straight. Um. So. Um, I have no problem with that, Mr. Chairman, but I would just note to the committee that typically when the government provides certified copies, we charge for it with their pen and ink, like $3.50 or $2 or something. I don't know what we charge, but there will be a little bit of software cost. And without the fee, I'm worried whether anybody will do it, but it doesn't have to have the fee to go forward at all. So if, that, if the gentleman would like the government to provide these things for free to people, um, I think that's a would be a new policy in the Commonwealth, but I don't have a problem with it. I think, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, the patron perhaps has the necessary votes without making that. Okay. All right. Uh, any further discussion? If not, record your vote. That one is reported more than one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
have the uh, substitute on 11 days. Is there a motion to adopt the substitute? Second. 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 Second.
Well, I don't think BML would. I'm, I'm actually from Vaco, but I don't okay, think either sorry, one of Vaco. us would. Right, I don't Vaco. think that either one of us would. Um, just pointing out, it's a it's a brand new duty um, of notice for a locality, and, and um, I kind of like the fee schedule, but um, but I'm just pointing out it's a, it's a new duty, a new responsibility that doesn't currently exist. But okay. I, I do. Your point is very well taken. Mr. Trump, thank you. So, ma'am, before you leave, so are you saying this is an unfunded mandate down to you? Um, yes, sir. Okay. okay. Anyone wish to ask where to speak in opposition? Hey, my name is Ron Clements. I'm with the Virginia Building and Code Officials Association. And one of the amendments we saw actually spoke to the building code. That's why I was originally came here today. This amendment really doesn't speak to the building code. It talks as an ordinance, yet the testimony I've heard refers to problems with a sewer system, which would not be an ordinance violation. That would be a maintenance code violation. Um, so uh, if the intent is that it's building and maintenance code violations, then we would object to this mainly because we object to legislating the building code. There's an administrative process to change the building code, which is currently open. So if that's the issue, I would uh, encourage you to gently lay this one on the table let us deal with it through the building code regulatory process. Um, if this is just intended to deal with ordinances under, I guess, Title 15, then I uh, probably don't have an objection to it. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Paul. Uh, Mr. Chairman, member of the committee, I'm Randy Grumbine. I represent the um, Virginia Manufacturer Modular Housing Association. Every day we fight to overcome stigmas in our industry, and in this case particularly, the, the term trailer park. So across the Commonwealth, there are many community owners, landlords, and park managers who strive to offer a safe, affordable place for Virginia residents to reside. There have been, regrettably, a few landlords who have put their interest ahead of the safety and welfare of their tenants. Senator McPike's bill strives to hold these landlords accountable. So, in alignment with our mission to preserve, protect, and promote the manufactured housing industry, we support that, that what the substitute is trying to do, namely to provide a timely notice to park residents who are affected by the violations that are detrimental to their health and safety. After hearing the concerns of other stakeholders, we think the best vehicle for providing that notice is through the property maintenance code, and we would support clarifying language as part of the code update process to do exactly that. So this would allow us to make use of the existing process for providing notice in these types of situations and avoid the practice of legislating the building code. With that said, we're going to reject this legislation. Thank you. Else. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Christy Mayer with the Virginia Poverty Law Center. And I actually am here to speak in support of this legislation. Um, as Senator Surabell um, pointed out in his question, we're talking here about the rights of homeowners. The majority of, there's a recent study done in Central Virginia regarding people who live in manufactured home parks. And that study found that almost 70% of those people living there own their own homes. So we're talking about homeowners. We're talking about the most affordable, perhaps the only affordable type of homeownership that remains um, really realistically for a large portion of our lower income residents. And so this notice bill is essential for them in or if they're going to have the opportunity in these circumstances to protect their homes which is often the only asset that they have, in addition to being where they raise their children. We also found through this study that most of the people living in these parks, at least in central Virginia, and I suspect the same is true in northern Virginia and across the Commonwealth, are families with young children. So we do support this legislation. Um, I appreciate what other stakeholders have said about doing this through the property maintenance code, but that process is a much slower process. And in the meantime, we are concerned that there are other parts in the Commonwealth that have um, persistent infrastructure problems where residents are not being notified of this and where they're going to be in the same very unfortunate position that the residents of the park of the Manassas are in right now. And so I would urge you to go ahead and, and report this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in support of the bill? 
Mr. Chairman, if I can sum up a couple things and respond to a couple points that have been brought up by some of the speakers. A few uh, points to note. This is not changing any of the building code framework, engineering principles, or anything else. All this is, is seeking to do is to provide notice. And I'll note that many of these owners own and have a mortgage on these properties. So this is a, you know, financially extremely important that they provide notice that their financial well-being is in jeopardy. And in cases where you're providing basic sanitary and other services as part of the park and rental agreement, it's important they know so they can take attendance assertion action. That's what failed in my district for nearly eight to nine years, and, and in about 30 days, 50 homeowners and families will be evicted from their homes. You've got these exact same issues in your districts. I know uh, manufactured homes exist throughout the Commonwealth. That's why um, the language before you was agreed to by the Manufacturers Association, uh, as well as others, despite some of the, the testimony of dissent of the Housing Commission. This is something that we need in place. They can still study it and still look at it throughout this year, but it's important that notices start to get out where we do have violations and issues going on. In terms of the VACO unemployment mandate issue, these are inspections that occur when they're complaint. So actually there's no additional uh, time in terms of investing in complaints. That's already on the work docket that exists today. So I suggest that this is an important piece of legislation to move forward. Any questions? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I have one yeah. quick question on the patron, if I may. Um, I just want to make sure I understand this properly. If the landlord doesn't fix a problem, then the city or locality is required to notify the tenants. So we're truly taking the burden from the, the landlord and moving it over to a city or locality. And is there a legal issue with that? I mean, we're, this, this is. Mr. Chairman, this is something that we debated amongst the stakeholders group, and, and frankly, what we came down to was who is best able to ensure that a, a notice is made where you have bad actors. Mr. Chairman, and, and so that was one, one of the, the, the things that we really debated and struggled with. Um, you know, others are more than welcome to comment on this, but you know, frankly, someone that is independent of a financial interest, which in this case is a local government, is in best a, uh, position to report findings to, to uh, tenants. Chairman, if I may, as a quick follow-up. So if the landlord, who probably is not the tenant, would, does not remedy a violation in seven days, which is a quick amount of time, then we're going to require the locality to inform the tenants that there's a health and safety issue where they reside I think that we may have an issue of liability here, one way or the other. And I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV, and I didn't sleep at a Holiday Inn. But it sounds like there's something still kind of questionable about it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, Senator so Deep, just very, very briefly, what I, what I would say to that is that the issue of liability still lays with the park owner or the, the landlord, but by providing notice to the tenants, the tenants then have the information and the opportunity to file something such as a tenant's assertion sooner rather than later and ask a court to actually impose that liability and, the op and enforce the obligation that the landlord already has under law. So it's not a shifting of the liability, it's the provision of notice in order for there to be an opportunity for the tenants to ask that the, uh, that the responsibility be enforced. Mr. Chairman, if I may, one last question. Okay, what happens if the locality or the city fails to notify within seven days? Or for whatever reason, they drop the ball and don't notify. So is there now an inherent liability on the city? Is, you know, what happens there? Yeah, there still would not be any liability to local government for that. They, they would certainly potentially have political liability in terms of accountability, and that's where it comes in in terms of voters getting what their government should be taking action on, but not from a, a legal liability standpoint. Yes, sir. Senator Ed. Um, I believe localities have sovereign immunity, so they would not have liability, although hopefully they would do what the law says.
Yeah, this is dealing with the health and safety of people. So um, I, I would move that we report the bill. Seconded. Senate bill, whatever. Reported. Any further? Explain my no vote. Wait, wait, wait. I mean, I mean, report the vote before you explain it. All right. It's 13 to 1 and 1 abstention. All right. I'm, just, I'm still uncomfortable with this, so I'm going to talk to a few other lawyers and get them to take this apart with me so I can better get comfortable with that. I think it's a great idea, but I'm just, I'm just not all the way there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Senator Vogel, while she's coming up, we're going to have to pass back to the week. So. We have to pay it back to week 1573 and 1575. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, member of the committee. I have Senate Bill 1530, and there are um, line amendments. Amigo is going to pass those out now, so I move the line amendments. The line amendments actually um, make the bill do what I intended the bill to do, which is not to have any procurement requirements or other restrictions, but to simply do what it is that um, I know all of you know, Ed Turner who has been an extraordinary advocate for the disability community here for years and years and years. And Ed and I have worked together on lots of legislation. And one of the things that he has pointed out is that um, the private sector does a pretty good job of, of managing and counting and keeping up with um, the numbers of those who they employ who um, have disabilities. But in the Commonwealth of Virginia, as a state employment matter, we don't always do so well. But at the same time, you actually can't legally ask. But we would like to be able to sort of record and follow and do better um, as a state employment matter. And so um, I can read you lots of information and lots of statistics, but the hour is late. But I will tell you um, that this would have a meaningful impact. This is merely aspirational. You can read the language. Um, the line amendment, to be very clear, takes out any of the issues that would um, cause any issues of procurement and create any restrictions. Um, and I will just say this because I think it's important to me and it's important to those of you who have worked with Mr. Turner over the years. This is his last year. He is going to retire. This is um, important to him and this is the thing that he has asked that we all, at least that I carry, um, as his retirement present. And I said, okay, Ed. Absolutely, I will. So um, with that, I would um, entertain any questions that the committee might have. I know Sarah Wilson is here. She can, she what? yeah. She hasn't abandoned me. <laughs> she can certainly entertain any questions that you might have, but that's that's what the bill does. It's pretty simple. Is there anyone here in opposition to Senate Bill 1530? I would like to clarify if I could. Yes, sure. please clarify. Well, Educate. I'm Sarah Wilson. I'm the agency head for the Department of Human Resource Management. We are very supportive of increasing the uh, people with disabilities in our workforce. I want to manage expectations. Any report we would generate is very understated. The best data we have is on veterans. We do not have very good data at all on other people because they don't want their employer to know if they have a disability. So they do not tell you. It is, we cannot ask them. You can voluntarily tell us and we can have an accommodation for you, but they don't want their employer to know. So it would be very difficult for us to tell you if we reach the aspirational goal of 5% when people do not want to share. But we do support the uh, people with disabilities and increasing the enrollment, but I want to manage expectations for what you would get from any report we would generate. Thank you. All right. Just briefly from Ms. Wilson, um, 
Is it possible to allow people or to provide some mechanism where they can voluntarily disclose? Yes, we do, we act. I mean, they can voluntarily disclose, but most people do not disclose. They choose not to. That's the thing. We could be doing very well in this area, but we would never know it. And you could be doing very badly, too. And we could be. We don't know. Okay, thank you. Okay. Is there a motion? Move to report. Second. Second. We move and second the bill be reported as amended. Any further discussion? If not, report your votes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thank you, Senator Reese, for voting for me. All right. Thank you. The bill passes 14 and up with one abstention. All right. Uh, you're, you're, you're almost in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. I've got Senate Bill 1586. Uh, the short version this will make the Roanoke County Library legal. Under the code, um, there needs to be a library board um, unless you are exempted. Several other localities are exempted. I think some of you serve those jurisdictions. This, um, we've had, we've been, uh, by the action of the Board of Supervisors in 1980, uh, creating our own uh, uh, library system as a county department. We function fine without a board. Um, of this nature, but we need to actually be reflected legally in the code, or else we'd be in violation and we'd be taking new action now that we're aware of it. Uh, the way it goes about doing this is provides exemptions for any county that has a charter, which is just Chesterfield and James City, and Chesterfield is already exempted. So this means we'd be exempted in Roanoke County, and if the majority leader's home county also chose to go this route, they would be exempted. That's what the bill does. Right. Any questions of paper? Right. Is anyone here in opposition to Senate Bill 1586? This is this is what everyone was waiting for earlier. <laughs> 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 no report. No. Probably moved and seconded that Senate Bill 1586 be reported. All in favor say aye. Or vote. That's for to explain it's on the floor. <laughs> we have two more bills to deal with. They're not on the docket. Regrettably, they're my bills, but finance has asked for them, and we do not have time to deal with them. We can't because they might have a physical impact. We can't deal with them next week. So I would ask for a motion to refer. 1139 and 1334 to finance. So, 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 so,